Today we're in the book of Ezekiel. We're in chapter 12. And so let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 12 at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 and 2 and get into our study. We'll be looking at the entire chapter, but let me lay a foundation for us here in Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel writes in chapter 12, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and ears to hear, but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Now, as we know, let me remind you of what is taking place here. We know that the prophet Ezekiel has been transported in a vision to the city of Jerusalem. And while Ezekiel was there in a vision, he had seen the evils of that particular city. And as he saw the evil of the city, it served to give him insight into the anger of the Lord and why God was bringing judgment on the nation of Israel. So after he saw this particular vision and he had seen the evil, he was returned to Babylon. And the message that he was to give was one of coming and sure judgment. He was also given, though, a message of hope, a message of hope for those who are going to remain faithful to the Lord. God was saying to them that they're going to be scattered, they're going to be exiled, but that he would bring them back to Israel. In chapter 11, verse 17, he had said, Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you, from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And so though they were going to be exiled, God was promising that this exile was not permanent, that he would bring them back. And when they returned, they would have something that they would do. Notice verse 18, they will go there and they will take away all its detestable things and all its abominations from there. And so those who are going to be returning are going to have a purging influence on that nation. God is going to give them His Spirit, and God is going to give them His Word, and, and they're going to keep His Word, and they're going to have fellowship with Him. But others will still reject Him. Others will follow after false gods, and ultimately, they will be rejected. He had said that in chapter 11, verse 21, as for those whose hearts follow the desires for their detestable things and their abominations, I'll recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. And so this is what's taking place. The Lord has given to him visions, has revealed certain things to him, and has given to him an order. The order is that he's to communicate what God has given to him. That's what we see in verse 25 in chapter 11 when he says, I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. And so God has given to him insight into what is about to take place. As this is taking place and as God has given to him these instructions, he now continues to proclaim coming judgment. And that's what we see here in Ezekiel chapter 12. He continues to proclaim this coming judgment, but the people are still refusing to believe. And in spite of the refusal to listen, Ezekiel is going to continue to faithfully proclaim God's message. It's interesting, but I want you to note, notice verse 1 here. I want you to note this. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Five times in one chapter... He uses the same phrase. The word of the Lord came to me saying. He says that five different times. He says it here in verse 1. He'll say it again in verse 8. You'll see it again in verse 17. You'll see it again in verse 21. You'll see it again in verse 26. He repeats this one phrase five different times. And Ezekiel, the reason he's doing that is making sure that, that they understand that this is the word of the Lord. He wants them to know that he's a prophet from God. And he wants them to know that, that he is faithfully giving to them the message that God delivered to him. So five times he says, the word of the Lord came to me. In other words, this isn't something optional. I'm not one of these false teachers that you're, you're used to having in the nation. I am a true prophet is what Ezekiel is saying. I'm a true prophet of God and the word that I have to speak to you is a sure word. This is going to actually take place. And you can understand that this indeed is coming from the Lord. He wants the people to know that God is, is speaking through him. But even as he begins to share with them the things that God has for them, God makes it very clear that these people are rebellious. These people don't have spiritual eyes. 
These people don't have spiritual ears. Notice verse 2. It says, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see and does not see, ears to hear but does not hear. They are a rebellious house. Even though the word of the Lord is coming to Ezekiel, the people he speaks to will refuse to hear what God has to say. Why? Because they are rebellious. They refuse to listen to God. They refuse even though God is speaking very clearly to them. Now, I mentioned to you when we began to study Ezekiel that he had contemporary prophets. There was also Daniel and there was also Jeremiah who prophesied in the same general time that Ezekiel prophesied. Jeremiah, the prophet, had said this in Jeremiah chapter 5 in verses 21 through 23. Jeremiah said, Hear this now, O foolish people without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not, do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. Jeremiah said the same thing. Isaiah, two centuries earlier, almost two centuries earlier, said the same thing. These people have eyes but refuse to see, ears they have but they refuse to listen. What he's dealing with is hardness of heart. And hardness of heart is a great sin because it's a condition that defies God when God is speaking. Closing your eyes and refusing to see always results in a continuation in pain and judgment. It's interesting that when you read the book of Acts, and it's got 28 chapters of, of what the Holy Spirit does in the birth of the church and in the initial mission of the church, it's interesting, if you're taking notes, it's found in Acts chapter 28. It's interesting how the book of Acts closes with verses 26 and 27. It doesn't close there, but as it's closing, in verses 26 and 27, it, it says, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. And then the reason is given, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Even in the book of Acts, God is continuing to speak concerning the nation in Israel that refused to see. It's the same nation that refused to see when Jesus Christ walked the face of the earth and actually quoted Isaiah in reference to them saying, this people sees but refuses to see, hears but refuses to hear. They are not willing to hear what the Spirit is saying. To bring it up to the 21st century and to make application Today, when people say they just disagree with the Bible, we need to understand that it is not simply an intellectual problem. There are many people who say, well, I just don't believe what the Bible says. Sometimes they'll say something like this. Perhaps you've heard this before. I've heard this. Where they'll say, it's so filled with contradictions. You know, the Bible is filled with contradictions. Well, the average person knows how to say that. But when you hand them a Bible and say, can you show me a couple? They, 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 they don't know of any. They, they simply are parroting what somebody else has told them. The Bible is filled with contradictions. And you hand them a Bible and you say, you know what, I don't want to be following the wrong things. And, and seeing that you're a fount of all wisdom and know what the Bible is wrong about, can you show me? And the fact is, is that they normally don't have anything that can really be presented as a contradiction. So it's not simply intellectual, and we need to be aware of that. It's not simply intellectual. It's not as if you can come and argue somebody into the kingdom of God with the wisdom of your argument and your eloquence. It doesn't work that way. It takes the Holy Spirit to convict a person of their sin. It takes the, the Word of God in conjunction with the Holy Spirit who awakens within that person a sense of being lost in need of a Savior. It comes through the Word of God faithfully presented and the Holy Spirit convicting the person hearing that word so that they might say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I see that that is speaking of me. And God, I need your forgiveness. It's not just intellectual. Sometimes we think that it is. Sometimes we think if I just have the right arguments, I can argue somebody into the kingdom of God. If I have just the right kind of argument, 
then I can show them the fallacies of the way that they think and show them the truthfulness of the way that God has revealed Himself, and it's simply not that easy. It's a spiritual blindness that they have, and it's the spiritual blindness that causes them to refuse to believe. If you take note, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And I want you to notice that Paul said this. He said, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. He said, who do not believe. Now, when you open up your Bible and you look at that verse and then you get some study helps and you open up the Greek because the New Testament was written in common Greek and you begin to look at the word and what its actual meaning is, you might find this interesting because when it says, who do not believe, the Greek language is literally saying who refuse to believe. And the point that Paul is making is they have refused to believe, so Satan got the power to blind their thoughts. That's the literal translation. That's what's taking place. They refuse to believe. And so it's not simply that you didn't give the right argument. It's that they will listen and not really hear. Now, I learned this a long time ago the hard way. When I first got saved and went into the military, I began encountering people with different religious philosophies and beliefs, and I started encountering people in the Jehovah's Witness organization, for example, and, and they, would, they would say things and argue. There was a lapsed Jehovah's Witness, because normally they didn't go into the military, but there was a lapsed Jehovah's Witness in the army that I served with, and, and uh, he and I got in a discussion, and, and I would open Scripture, and I would show him the little that I knew. I was a new believer myself. I really didn't have a whole lot to give, but the little that I had, I tried to share with him, and I was amazed that, that he wouldn't listen. He would not listen at all. And then later on, when I got out of the military, I was, I was living in Whittier at the time, and, and there was a knock on the door, and Two women came, were at the door, and I opened the door to them, and I said, hello, how can I help you? And they said, we're Jehovah's Christian witnesses, and we want to share with you about the kingdom of God. And, and I, I knew very little about them, and so I said, well, come on in. You know, um, I'll leave the door open so you're not afraid, and uh, we can talk. And so I left the front door open. They sat down there uh, on the couch next to the door in case I got up and chased them around, I guess. I don't know. And uh, we began to speak, and as we began to speak, they began to share some things with me that I just, I was a new believer. I was only two and a half, three years old in the Lord, and I'd spent two years in the military, so I really didn't have a whole lot of understanding yet, and it just wasn't working. The things that they were saying, I disagreed with, and, and yet when I'd say to them, I don't agree with that, they'd say, well, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says, and they kept saying that to everything that I said, and but I knew there was something wrong with their argument. I simply couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know their theology. I didn't know anything about them. And so I said, you know, I, I, I would like to talk to you again. Now, for them, that, that seemed to be an invitation that I was getting ready to follow after their ways and all. But in reality, what I was doing is buying a week so I could do some research. And so I said, could you come back? And they said, yes. And so they left. And then that week, I went to a Christian bookstore and I bought... Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults, and, and Walter Martin has over 100 pages on Jehovah's Witnesses, their origins and their theology, and, and, and I read the, that, that 100 pages. I memorized much of his arguments and the scriptures and things and was waiting for them when they came back. And they came back the next week, and as they knocked on the door, it was the same woman, but this time she had a different woman with her. And then it hit me because the week before, she had asked me, what's your name? And I told her, David. She said, what's your last name? And I said, Rosales. And she said, and what kind of name is that? I said, I'm a Mexican. So the next week, she came with a Mexican woman. <laughs> like all of a sudden, I was going to say, it must be true, one of mine. <laughs> anyway. They came in and they sat down. And I began to speak to them, and, and I said, last time you were here, you said this, but this is what the Bible says. 
Last time you were here, you said this, but this is what the Bible says. You kept saying, this is what the Bible says, but this is what the Bible actually says. Where does it say that Jesus Christ came back invisibly in the early 1900s and is now in Brooklyn, New York? Where does it say that? Because they teach that. You may not know that, but they teach that. And I began to bring different things up that I learned. I said, this is what the Word of God says. This is what the Word of God says. I thought for sure my argumentation just stolen straight from Walter Martin was going to cause them to fall on their face and say, God is with you, we need Jesus. But they didn't do that. And I discovered a long time ago that you can have the proper arguments and you can actually point it out. You can say, this is what it says. You've discovered this, I discovered this. Jehovah's Witnesses do not answer questions. They answer questions with questions. So if you say, well, what does John 8, 58 say? They'll say, but how about, and then they, they try and take you somewhere else. They learn to debate that way. That's why some of you get caught by them, because you don't make them answer the question you're asking. But I learned to do that. I'd say, we'll discuss your question after you answer mine. What does this Scripture say? And that's how I learned to debate. So I debated with them. I, I got fairly good at it. I actually used to hunt them. You know, I would drive, I'm serious, I would drive up and down the street just looking for it, you know, because, I mean, I really enjoyed the discussion. But the Lord taught me a long time ago, you can argue and still you win the argument, but you lose the soul. And I found out why. It's because they refuse to believe because they are blinded. It's a spiritual battle. Now, I tell you all of that to say this. It's not a worthless endeavor to give them the Word of God, but don't be surprised when they refuse to believe. Don't be surprised when, when they walk away just as blind as when you first began that conversation. It's a blessing when God actually convicts them and they, they go home and begin to think about what was said and, and God actually draws them to Himself. But what God is speaking about here in Ezekiel is true today, and that is that people refuse to believe. And that's what he's saying here in Ezekiel 12, 2, when he says, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see and does not see, ears to hear, but does not hear. They are a rebellious house. Ezekiel, you have been given my word. You speak forth my message. But they refuse to listen. Refusal to believe results in spiritual blindness, and it happens with willful disbelievers. To bring it up to the 21st century in a different way, another application, that's what we're seeing today as a result of simply believing in God's Word. We see people who argue with us related to whether God's Word says something or whether it doesn't. We see that today. We saw that worked out just yesterday with the court's decision on Proposition 8, which I rejoice to see that the court upheld that decision. But you can expect that the war is on. One reverend wrote a letter to the editor in the Orange County Register, and she once again wrote the same kind of message that ignores Scripture, preferring popular opinion. I read it just today. And this is an excerpt from that particular letter. She said, Jesus preached nothing about homosexuality, but everything about inclusion of the excluded, social justice, and above all, love. We believe that it is the responsibility of the faith community to uphold the prophetic voice so that even when society chooses to act unjustly, we urge the voice of compassion, we speak the words of freedom, and we struggle for justice. And I found it interesting because once again she says, Jesus preached nothing about homosexuality but everything about inclusion of the excluded. That's typical of those who do not subscribe to the whole counsel of God. And that is what has kept people in darkness, and that's what God makes very clear is not good. In the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. 
because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. For her to say that Jesus said nothing about homosexuality is incorrect. Jesus used the city of Sodom during his teachings as an example of sin and judgment. You see that in Luke 17, 28 and 29, when Jesus was speaking of the days of Lot. Jesus said they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus used Sodom as an example. You see, the city of Sodom was proverbial for homosexual sin. You see that in Genesis chapter 19. And you also see it in the New Testament book of Jude. Because in verse 7 of the book of Jude, it says, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. The term strange flesh in Jude verse 7 speaks of homosexuality are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jesus did not ignore sin. Jesus openly confronted it. You need to remember the first recorded message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. In that, the first recorded message is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached a need for repentance. So those who would argue that he was calling for inclusion to those who were excluded are failing to remember that his first message is one of repentance. You cannot be included if your sin excludes you. That's the reason he came, so that you might have life in him. You don't automatically enter into heaven because you try very hard. You enter into heaven because he did it all for you, and you repented, and you received the grace that was offered to you through faith in him. So Jesus offers freedom, and Jesus taught us that sin is bondage, but that he came to set us free. In John 8, he says this in verses 34 through 36. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus made it very clear that sin is bondage. And as long as you are addicted to your sin, you are excluded from the kingdom of God. There was a woman. This woman is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. A very famous woman, a woman who was caught in the sin of adultery. We know that story very well. All of us are familiar with that, how that she was brought before the Lord Jesus Christ, basically cast down in front of him as he was teaching, and then those who were bringing accusations against her said, Master, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And Moses in the law said that this kind of woman should be stoned. But what do you say? And the reason they did that quite obviously is because they wanted to trap him. If Jesus said, let her go, they would have said, he doesn't honor Moses. If Jesus said, enact the law of Moses and have her stoned, then they could appeal to Rome and say, this man is calling for the death penalty and has no authority to do so. So they thought that they had the Lord Jesus Christ on the horns of a dilemma. They thought that they had caught him. We know the story very well. At first he ignores. Then he begins to write on the ground as they continue speaking to him. The only place in the New Testament that ever points to Jesus writing, and we don't know what he wrote. Now, there are so many commentators who have ideas of what he wrote, but we don't know. I lean in the direction, though, he might have written the law, seeing that they were calling on him to uphold it, because the law speaks concerning adultery, that if a woman is caught in adultery, she is to be put to death, and so is the one who was caught with her. There was no man present. They obviously were going after the woman, and they weren't going after the man. Where was the man? It may very well be that he wrote the law. The adulteress and the adulterer shall both be stoned. Whatever the case may be, he acted as if he didn't listen to them, and then he stood up and he spoke to them, and he said to them, the one who is amongst you without a sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. And from the very oldest to the very youngest, they began to just 
walk away. They melted. And that's when Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? Has none accused you? She says, none, Lord. And he said to her, neither do I accuse you. But he also said something that we need to remember. It's found in John 8, verse 11. He said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and finish your affair. Go and continue what you've been doing, did he? He said, go and sin no more. I'm showing you mercy, and I'm giving you compassion. For those who would say that Jesus never spoke against sin and never alluded to homosexuality, they don't read the Bible. They don't know the Lord. They have eyes, but they do not see. Ears they have, but they do not hear. Their hearts are rebellious towards the things of God. And that's what was taking place at that time. For someone to argue that Jesus would approve of homosexual marriage, well, they're simply wrong. God speaks of those who willfully reject his word and preach contrary to what he has said. In Psalm 50, verses 6 and 16 and 17, it says, To the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or to take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? You have no right to speak in my behalf because you're not giving my word, is what he is saying. You don't want my word to dictate your thought life, and you don't want to proclaim my word to those who would be set free by it. You see, that's what's taking place during the day of Ezekiel. Eyes they have, but they do not see. Ears they have, but they do not hear. Why? They're rebellious because they're not willing to obey. That's your introduction. We better get into the heart of the message. <laughs> Verse 3. Therefore, son of man, prepare your belongings for captivity. Go into captivity by day in their sight. You shall go from your place into captivity to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider, though they are a rebellious house, by day you will bring out your belongings in their sight as though going into captivity, and at evening you shall go in their sight like those who go into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry your belongings out through it. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulders and carry them out at twilight. You shall cover your face so that you cannot see the ground, for I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. So I did as I was commanded. I brought out my belongings by day as though going into captivity, and at evening I dug through the wall with my hand. I brought them out at twilight, and I bore them on my shoulder in their sight. And so that's what's taking place here. Ezekiel goes into his house as God told him to. He packs lightly. He digs a hole through the wall of his house. He then climbs out through the opening, covers his eyes, stumbles down the street. Covering his eyes represents people being blinded and stumbling into captivity. And according to verse 7, he obeys in acting the word of God before the people. So, verse 8, in the morning, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, the rebellious house said to you, what are you doing? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, this burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are among them. Say, I am assigned to you. As I've done, so shall it be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. They shall dig through the wall to carry them out through it. He shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will spread my net over him, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. And so people saw what he's doing, as you read, and, and their interest is piqued, and, and they now ask him about it. And so his message simply points out that Jerusalem, as well as King Zedekiah, are about to go into exile. Zedekiah is going to disguise himself, but he's going to get caught, and he will be blinded by Nebuchadnezzar. And you see that taking place in 2 Kings 25, verses 5 through 7, where it says, The army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. They overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him, so they took the king and brought him up 
uh, to the king of Babylon at Riblah. They pronounced judgment on him. They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. And so the word of God is sure, and that's a point that he's making. He says, you're going to enact this. You're going to show them something because the houses there in, in the region that he was at were built there on the roadway. You're going to dig a hole with your hand through the wall. They'll see you coming in. They'll see you coming out. They're going to ask about it, and you can tell them this is what's going to take place in Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen. God is going to deal with you. It says in verse 14, I will scatter to every wind all those who are around him to help him and all his troops, and I will draw out the sword after them. And then they shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from the sword, from famine, from pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. I'm not going to destroy them completely. There will be a remnant. God always leaves a remnant. There will be a remnant. And this remnant will have the responsibility of explaining why this has taken place to the nation of Israel. The remnant is going to say, we have sinned against God. We have done this evil in His sight. He wiped us as one uh, wipes a bowl. He took care of us in this fashion because we rebelled against Him. And that's what the remnant is going to do. He's going to scatter them, but leave a small remnant. You know, it's been said, when people fail to learn in times of prosperity, they sometimes learn in days of adversity. And that's what's going to take place. The survivors will be living witnesses to the world that God is holy and God is just. Well, in verse 17, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, eat your bread with quaking, drink your water with trembling and anxiety, and say to the people of the land, Thus says the Lord God to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the land of Israel, They shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water with dread, so that her land may be emptied of all who are in it because of the violence of all those who dwell in it. Then the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste and the land shall become desolate, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now he's out there seated before the people, eating and drinking, and, and he's, as he's doing so, he's got an exaggerated trembling that's taking place. And so as the people see him out there in, in, in plain view eating and all, they begin to wonder why. Why are you doing this? So he says, this is what's going on in Jerusalem. This is how the people will act as they tremble in fear. And the sufferings of the inhabitants, the sufferings of those who are going through all of this is on their own head. Why? Because they've been violent. It says it in verse 19, because of the violence of all those who dwell in it, because they have been unkind, uncaring, they have mistreated others, and they're going to reap what they have been sowing. Verse 21, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, what is this proverb that you people have? about the land of Israel, which says the days are prolonged and every vision fails. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will lay this proverb to rest, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. Say to them, the days are at hand and the fulfillment of every vision. For no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord God. They had developed a proverb, as he says here, and that's why God is asking him about it. What, what the proverb related to was God's word and the fact that it remained unfulfilled. That's what the proverb is speaking about. The days are prolonged and every vision fails is another way of saying God has said certain things and he has failed to fulfill the things that he has said. It's like saying time passes but no vision ever produces any fruit. But God's response is to say, my word is going to produce the fruit that it's intended to produce in the time that it is expected to produce that. God is not on my timetable. God is on his own timetable. But what had happened is they were aware of the fact that God had made statements concerning judgment that would come upon them. They're saying nothing's happened, therefore God's going to do nothing. And they didn't understand that God was just waiting, but that indeed he was going to do what he had stated. 
Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God sends out his word. It accomplishes its purpose, but it does so in the time that he intends for it to accomplish that purpose. It's interesting how it says in verse 24, For no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. The false prophets, the, the, the in individuals there who are, are leading them astray are not going to prosper. They're going to be dealt with. They've been saying judgment isn't going to come. But God is saying, oh, it's on its way, and you are going to experience it. In verse 25, I am the Lord. I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord. It's coming. It's going to come, and it's a sure word. It's going to happen. In Lamentations 2.17, it says, The Lord has done what he purposed. He's fulfilled his word which he commanded in days of old. He's thrown down and has not pitied. He has caused an enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the horn of your adversaries. It's going to come, and it's going to be coming in the right moment. You see, finally, in verse 26, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, look, the house of Israel is saying the vision that he sees is for many days from now. He prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be postponed anymore, but the word which I speak will be done, says the Lord God. Sometimes people take the patience of the Lord as permission from the Lord. He doesn't deal with you the instant you do something wrong, and so you think that it must be okay. And so you continue in that behavior when all along he's simply giving you space to repent. He's giving you opportunity to repent. He's actually long-suffering. He's, he's holding back to give you a lot of room so that his convicting spirit can work in your life and draw you so that you don't end up ruining your life and reaping consequences that are, are tragic and painful for you. I can't tell you over the years how many times I've ministered to people on a personal level who have been going in a path and I've said, you know what, you're going to hurt. You're going to end up in a lot of pain. You're stepping into an area that you're really not ready for, and beyond that, it's simply wrong. You're going to end up hurting. God is going to chasten you. He's going to deal with you. He loves you. He's going to work with you. He's going to, but you've got to get right. That's no big deal. God hasn't done anything yet. Probably he's never going to do anything. I remember many years ago when our church first began, a woman came into my office and wanted to have a, a moment of counseling with me. And at that time, I, I felt that I should talk to her. And so she came in and she was speaking to me. She asked me a question. Actually, she called me. She asked me the question. She said, does God forgive every sin? Make a long story very short she was making plans to enter into a sin. And I told her, listen, I said, what you're planning to do, God is going to deal with you in. She said, well, I want to go out with this guy. She was a young lady, and she wanted to go out with this, this guy who wasn't a Christian. And I said, honey, I said, the Word of God makes it very clear. You are not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, God forbids those unequal yokings what in common does light have with darkness? What in common does Jesus Christ have with Satan? What in common do you as a believer have with somebody who rejects Jesus Christ? God forbids it from the old and forbids it in the new. She says, well, can't he come to faith in Christ? I said, well, God is able to save anybody who's willing to come to him. She says, have you ever seen somebody come to Christ that was in this situation? And I said, I haven't. Well, can that person come to Christ if they're in this situation, if they're dating a Christian and all? And I said, listen, I don't want to close the door on the grace of God. God can save anybody he wants. Well, would you have a percentage that you were willing to give on that? I mean, this woman was insistent. And I said, listen, let's just put it this way, less than 
I said, how would I know? Less than 1%. She said, then I'll take my chance with that 1%. I'll never forget that. And hung up the phone, bang. I mean, her mind was bent on that. I'm going to do it. I had a guy call me one time, years ago now, and my secretary said, there's a man who has an emergency. He needs to talk to you now. I said, I, I, I can't. I'm, I, she said, he says, it's really, it's really, really important. He has to speak to you now. And I said, have him come at lunchtime. I'll talk to him. I'll never forget this. He came into my office. He sat right across from me. He said, Pastor, does God forgive every sin? And I said, does God forgive every sin? He says, yes. Does God forgive every sin, including the sin of adultery? I said, God forgives every sin because God is a merciful God. And I shared with him the doctrine of, 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 of salvation, how God forgives sins when you confess and repent. He says, so every sin? I said, every sin has been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. All sins? All sins. He said, thank you. I needed to hear that. He left. And then he went to home and he left his wife for a woman he had been having an affair with. Left his family, left his wife, and walked out of my office thinking that it was okay because God forgives every sin. And in his mind, that means even the sin that he's planning on doing the minute he leaves my office. People have this idea that they can play loose with the Lord's grace. But what they're doing is they're taking advantage of God and it demonstrates that they have no love for, the, for him. These people here in this particular time are saying in verse 27, the vision that he sees is for many days from now. He prophesies of times far off. This judgment that he keeps speaking about is not coming soon. It's going to be years from now. We have nothing to be concerned about. This is going to happen in the distant future, so don't worry about it. Well, that reminds me of 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, where the apostle said, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You Christians have been saying, Jesus is going to return. He hasn't come now. He hasn't shown up yet. Same mentality. And therefore, eat, drink, enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you die. Tomorrow you die. This Greek mentality found its way into the church to the point that the Apostle Paul even quoted that proverb during that day, eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow you die. The Greeks didn't believe in a future eternity of any sort. And it ran headlong into the Jewish mind that we're just passing through because there's something better waiting for us. And the church still deals with that to this day. Members of the body of Christ who are saying, it doesn't really matter if I do these things now because God is gracious, he'll forgive me, no big deal. And all of these things are yet far off. Well, the Bible says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason that God gives you a moment, he gives you time, is because he's not willing that you should perish. God doesn't want us to perish, and therefore he gives you time to repent. He doesn't give you time to continue till you outgrow your sin. He doesn't give you time to continue till you have your fill of it because, frankly, one sin only leads to another. And those who argue and say that one drug doesn't lead to another are people who never took drugs because that's an absolute lie. Because you start with one thing and it moves you to something else, and then it moves you to something else. I don't know anyone in my experience of doing drugs myself or ministering to those who have, I don't know anyone, perhaps there's someone in this room who has a different testimony and an experience different than mine, and I'll, I'm willing to hear it. But I just have never met anybody who said, oh yeah, alcohol is my, my drug of choice and I just stay with that. No, most of the time, I've known people who will drink, but they also drink different kinds of things, not just wine. I've got to drink some beer. I'll drink some beer. I'll drink some whiskey. There's a variation of the same theme. In, 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 
in drug taking, you smoke the pot, but you also want to do some of the meth, and then sometimes you want to do the cocaine, and then sometimes you want to do, and you learn to use other drugs. I didn't use just marijuana. I used whatever I could get my hands on and moved further on and further on, taking more and more in different kinds. That's what happens. You don't outgrow sin. You repent and turn from it. And you don't say that God has given me grace right now to continue in sin. You say God's grace has been extended to me to save me from it. So we don't take advantage of the grace of God. These people were saying, oh, yeah, God will bring judgment, but it's not for a long time, so don't worry about it. God is saying, no, it's coming soon. You ought to be worried about it because my word is sure, and you're going to learn. And that's what he says. None of my words will be postponed anymore. The word which I speak will be done, says the Lord God. 